Hello and welcome to New Consciousness Activation. Hi, Greg. Um, I want to welcome you to our conversation today. And um, I think our connection is a little bit unstable. No, I think it's good. Um, so, Greg, you have been a journalist and you're an um, Utah journalism, correct? Right. You're, um, you're an author and a speaker. You have two books published. And um, I'd like you to just fill in any gaps and give a little bit of an, uh, more of an introduction for yourself. Okay. Well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I would say that my fascination with the subjects that we're going to talk about today, which are passion and callings, uh, started way before my resume formally did. Um, okay. I've just been fascinated my whole life about how people create a life that actually belongs to them uh -huh. and isn't a knockoff. And so my, my younger years, my, my entire career has been devoted to looking at this question of how people create a sense of authenticity uh -huh. and a sense of integrity with themselves. Um, and it's just been one of, I ran across an Italian writer years ago named Alberto Moravia and he said it was important to pursue what he called the one problem you were born to understand. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of mine. Um, how do people create a truly authentic life and one that's in integrity with who they are? And I mean integrity um, not as a moral issue, but a psychological issue. Right. Okay. Wonderful. So one of the things that um, you, as you said, you focus on is uh, passion. Passion for life, passion for um, I guess, self-realization, self-actualization. So um, as we explore new consciousness activation in these conversations, um, one of the things that we're looking at is kind of how consciousness has shifted in 2012 from the old energy to the new, from um, where in the old energy where the focus was more on survival and kind of safety and security. And if you look at it in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it was, the, you know, the more base uh, interests and right. uh, basic needs. And, and now in the past, you know, just a few years, we're starting to enter this new consciousness where the focus can shift more towards finding your passion and finding your joy and um, searching for that greater meaning. So I'm curious why you think passion is important or to what extent it's important in our lives right now. Well, for multiple reasons. One is something you just mentioned is, I think one of the primary dramas for most people in relationships, certainly to their vocational life. Uh, and by the way, that means just simply to be called. It doesn't necessarily refer just to work. Mm -hmm. um, but the primary drama seems to be the, the struggle between passion and security. Mm -hmm. and, um, my observation, as well as my experience, is that in the contest between the two of those, security tends to win. Uh, like you said, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, food, clothing, shelter, belonging, safety, security. Um, mm -hmm tends to win and the self-actualization, which is the piece at the top of the pyramid, right. tends to get back burnered. Mm -hmm. uh, our passions, our sense of calling, uh, tend to get um, put off to the side. And I don't believe that we can do that with impunity. Um, certainly for anybody who's say midlife or older, they get it that, that uh, time is more limited, that they have uh, a use by date. <laughs> and they just don't know what it is, um, and that they need to make good on the passions, otherwise they're gonna die with um, terrible regrets. And I read a story written by a hospice nurse named mm -hmm. Bronnie Ware, and it's called The Five Biggest Regrets of the Dying. Number one on that list was that I lived the life other people thought I should live rather than the one that really belonged to me. That was the number one regret. And so in order to avoid that, I think we need to tend to the soil of our own passions and at least get them uh, along with the security. There's nothing inherently wrong with security. Right. But uh, pushing down the passions just to focus on safety and security is not a good bet. Um, and if nothing else, the human psyche is kind of like the earth in the sense that it's a closed system, mm -hmm. in the sense that there's no 
away as in running away. There's no out as in throwing the garbage out. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, there's no trash icon. <laughs> um, we're sitting in front of computers and that just popped into my mind. You know, whatever we push down is simply going to come up someplace else in the system. Exactly. I ran across a beautiful description of that from a Mexican poet named Jose Frias. He said, I tried to, to drown my sorrows with drink, but the damn things learned how to swim. <laughs> and that is a great description of what they call systems theory, which yep. is that everything's hitched to everything else and you can't push these kind of things down kind of and get away with it. So mm -hmm. I think it's increasingly important, not just for, our, for individuals, but like you said, for the collective to really honor our passions because the world needs passionate people. It doesn't need people, more people to follow directions. It needs people to make them. So, passion. Yeah, and I absolutely, I completely agree with that. And, and um, from my personal experience, I shared with you before, um, I have spent many years working with college level students. Mm -hmm. And what I find that as they enter the institution and I ask them, what are your, and I ask them very, um, intentionally a very kind of big question. What are your hopes and dreams for the future? I don't tell them, I don't ask them, what would you like to be when you grow up? But what are your hopes and dreams for the future? And what I have found um, in about 90, 95% of um, situations is that students choose security over passion. Mm -hmm. They begin to list things like, uh, well, I want to have enough money, or I want to have a job that's secure, or in some cases, these 18 year olds say, I want um, to have a pension plan that, you know, that's gonna keep me secure, which just blows me away. But, you know, it's not coming from them, it's coming from an older generation that has really um, instilled those thoughts and ideas in them. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, how do we change that if our young generation is already sort of set in, in within that? Now, within a year or two, they start realizing that when they choose a path that they really have no passion for, mm -hmm. it quickly becomes old and tired, tiring. And so they begin to shift. But how have you found a way to, um, have you found, I guess, is it more the older generation that comes to that? And you said that, you know, older people kind of get it maybe um, to a greater extent because they, you know, they have less time left. Uh, right. Well, I think that we're all at any age, we're all tutored in mm -hmm. how to turn our backs on our authenticity and our passions and focus on the security. Um, I ran across a book called A Little Book on the Human Shadow by a poet named Robert Bly. And th that book has the most elegant, simplest uh, explanation for why we tend to do that over the course of life. And what he's essentially doing is going all the way back to the beginning of people's individual lives and looking at the, the things that happen to them that make them make these kind of comments by the time they're in college, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, says that all of us start out life with a nice round globe of life force, um, a 360 degree personality where energy, enthusiasm, exuberance are pretty much radiating out from us in every direction until our parents start sending us to our rooms for radiating certain parts of it. Right. Right? Um, I, I did a phone consultation with a woman a couple of years ago who said that uh, when she was growing up, her parents sent her to her room for any displays of negative emotions, oh, wow. tears, mm -hmm. uh, anger, uh, sadness. So they're punishing her for that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, she's 40 years old, now we're on the phone. She's saying that after a lifetime of, of repressing half of her emotional repertoire, mm -hmm. she's of course feeling blocked mm -hmm. from being her full, powerful, vital self. And the one that she's gonna need in order to become the healer that she intuited herself to be and build a career and a life around that, okay? Then, so what, what Bly says is that everybody carries around, from the time they're really little, an invisible bag. 
and whatever parts of us our parents don't like get sliced off that nice round pie and stuffed in the bag. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on to describe, then we get in school and in order to make friends and have report cards that say gets along well with others, we slice even more off the pie, stuff it in the bag. Then we get into the working world, same thing. In order to you know, make friends and influence people, you slice even more off. So these are the parts that say organizational life would prefer you leave out in the parking lot when you punch into work. Mm -hmm. Like your emotional life, your spiritual life, your, your personal life. So mm -hmm. what Bly says is that by the time we're 20, uh, the average person has a slice left over from that original nice round pie of vitality. Mm -hmm. so we spent the first 20 years trying to figure out what's got to go in the bag to get along with the powers that be. And the rest of our lives trying to get them out again. And that's not so easy. And it's not surprising when you say that you hear students make comments about, I, I better have a pension. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I guess why I'm sharing that is to give an, a, a generous bow to what each one of us are up against in trying to reclaim our vitality, our vitalities. You know, is we've got... Um, a lot of schooling, as it were, in how to avoid it, how to choose security over passion, how to avoid our exuberances and our restless selves and our um, messy creative selves and our sadness and our tears. And you know what I'm saying? Uh, we have to at least begin by acknowledging what we've lost. And I think that's part of the healing that needs to happen is acknowledging where you lose, where you've lost your life force and so when when we lose life force i just want to i guess related to the experiences of people that are listening now so what can it look like i mean it's actually i mean all of the things that we um that people uh, may go into therapy for it's you know sadness depression actual lack of i mean lack of vitality obviously just lack of energy um lack of loss of interest in life like what are some of the actual experiences that people can have if they you know seemingly make the right decision and choose security you know initially but like what can it lead to if that's the only focus yeah okay what can it lead to uh well robbing yourself of life force literally i mean vitality um right. just focusing on security is I mean, again, I'm not, I don't mean to badmouth security. It's important to no, have, absolutely. it's important to be able to pay the bills and all that good stuff. Um, but uh, pushing our gifts and our talents and our energies down is going to come up someplace else in your system. It's going to come up through symptoms. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the word symptom means a sign. That's the origin of the word. Right. Uh, a sign of what? All right. The word pathology means the logic of pain. What's the logic? It's going to come out as pain. It's going to come out as dreams that don't leave us alone. It's going to come out as um, what Freud called repetition compulsions, you know, making the same mistake over and over, um, attracting the same kind of partner continually, getting fired again, a lesson you've endlessly had to learn, you know. Um, so it's going to come out in the kinds of uh, dysfunctional patterns that people normally find in their lives. And by the way, Thomas More who wrote that wonderful book, Care of the Soul, said that repression of the life force is what drives most people into therapy. Mm -hmm. All right. So it comes out in all the varieties of forms of repression of the life force that people can experience. And um, yeah, so that's why I think it needs, it needs tending because otherwise you're, you're just trying to keep your chin above water all the time and you're not really thriving. You're in survival mode. You're, you're, as you said, you're at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. Right. Absolutely. Rather than the top. And, and this is what Maslow said about that top part of the uh, pyramid, mm -hmm. which is self-actualization. He said self-actualizing people, in other words, people who tend to fulfill their potentials, make the growth choice over the fear choice as much as a dozen times a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that's a bar set pretty high. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it reminds me of a mentor of mine. I was having lunch with him. I was telling him that I was terrified of quitting my job as a reporter to be a freelance writer. 
which is what I was called to do at that point in my life and was ignoring it for five years because I was simply terrified. And I told him over lunch, I said, I'm just, I'm scared. I'm going to fail at it. Mm -hmm. and he leans across the table and he says, Greg, if you're not failing regularly, you're living so far below your potential that you're failing anyway. Wow. Yeah. That's powerful. Which explains why I had lunch with him maybe once a year. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be pushed too far on that. But that's what it requires. It requires pushing past our comfort zone. Right. You know, and, and, and taking risks, starting small. I'm a big believer in starting small with the risks. Um, in other words, take a step towards something that you feel called toward in whatever arena. And then look at the feedback your life gives you. Take another step. Look at the feedback your life gives you. Um, do you feel better or worse? Take another step. Do you feel expanded or contracted? Mm -hmm. Take another step. What does your body tell you? What, is you? what do your dreams tell you? Do your friends tell you? Right. And I, and I want to um, go back for a minute to the symptoms. And you just said, what does your body tell you? You know, there is a field, a growing field right now of biological decoding. And I can't recollect the, there are a couple of people that are um, kind of at the forefront of that field, but it's yeah. basically understanding exactly what you said. It's, you know, a symptom is, is, is a sign of something. What is it a sign of? Um, it's taking any physiological condition, any health condition and really decoding it and understanding it as the language of your body. And, and what, many people don't realize is that many of the conditions we have are actually caused by this, uh, could be caused by this exact thing. It's right. Um, so there's a, there's a psychologist named um, Arnold Mindell who mm -hmm. started something called process oriented psychology. And he's a brilliant body mind guy. He says, and he said this to me in an interview for the callings book, he said, symptoms are usually dreams trying to come true, which I think taps into your idea of biological decoding. Right. Symptoms are dreams trying to come true. So the question would be, identify some recurring symptom in your body, just anything that's got your attention, and give it a voice and let it fill in the blank. So this is, right. would be the symptom speaking to you saying, my dream is that you would, and then fill in the blank. Exactly, yes. Right? Yeah. So um, I ran across a woman at a writer's conference in Albuquerque years ago. She comes up to me after my presentation and she says, um, one of those things that people won't generally say to you unless they're pretty sure they're never going to see you again. Um, she said, um, hey, you, do you know why I'm so fat? Mm -hmm. And then not a question you're supposed to answer. Um, <laughs> and then she answered it by saying, it's because I have so many stories inside of me that I'm not writing down. Mm -hmm. Now, there it is. Um, if you were to decode that, you'd see that the symptom, in the sense that it was a sign, meant something. And she knew exactly what it meant. Her body was telling her, my, I, my dream, the, the dream in the body is I want you to write. My dream is that you would write. Mm -hmm. and I just was fascinated by that. And that happened right after my interview with Arnold Mindell. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I have a whole file of, if, including from my own body, showing biological decoding. But it's right. intended, like it is with dreams, yeah. like with dreams, to decode them. Spend a little time in dialogue with the dreams and the dream characters and the mm -hmm. symptoms and the, and the pathologies and ask them what their logic is, what their dream is. But you need to be willing to turn and face the pursuers, you know, the symptoms and, and enter into conversation with them. The Buddhists call it taking tea with the demons. Mm -hmm. It's imperative to, to do that. Right, absolutely. So I want to go to one of the quotes from your book. It's a book from um, the vitals. Uh, the book is Vital Signs. It's your latest book. Um, and you quote um, uh, an Indian spiritual teacher, Sri Nisargatara. Right. And he said that the problem is not desire. It's that our desires are too small. So um, can you talk to us about you know, as we are awakening, as human beings are awakening, what are the big desires that we should have? What are, you know, at which level should we dream? That's a fascinating question. Um, well, I think one of the things that I got out of that quote is um, that we're not dreaming big 
and, mm -hmm. and giving ourselves credit for how big we in fact are. Right. Um, you don't have to look far for that, that um, data, that evidence. So, you know, all you need to do is compliment somebody, for instance, to see what a tremendous impact um, a kind word can have to somebody in the middle of their day, especially if they're having one of those days. You know, to realize how powerful we actually are. Um, and, and dreaming big is also about self-actualization, of course. Is what am I capable of? You know, what are my gifts? Um, you know, you have to put this in perspective, too. I, I used to have a, a flyer on the, a poster on the wall in my office that said, the trouble with trying to change the world, talking about big dreams, the trouble with trying to change the world is that weeks can go by and nothing happens. You know, and I was up there to tease myself about my own ambitions. Right. So, you know, you need to be grounded. You, know, you need roots and wings. Mm -hmm. But um, I really think that, and I include myself in this, how often we underestimate ourselves. Um, I, for instance, I'll give you an example from, from my own files. For years and years, I convinced myself I was not a good enough writer to get anything published in the New York Times. All right. Mm -hmm. That is my hometown newspaper because that's where I'm from. And uh, for years, I just convinced myself, don't even bother sending anything to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just decided on a sheer whim to send them something. And it got rejected, but I, I continued to send them things. And after maybe a year of doing that, they accepted one of my essays, and it appeared in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. And suddenly it blew that whole story out of the water. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that I'm not good enough. And then I had to question, what else do I think I'm not good enough to do or not powerful enough or not smart enough or whatever? Um, so that helped me to just expand my whole territory. Um, and I think you need to ask that question from time to time. Um, what stories am I telling myself that are keeping me small? Mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell, you know, the guy who popularized the hero's right. journey, he said the spiritual journey is um, a man standing or a woman standing on a whale fishing for minnows. <laughs> and that says a lot to me. It's like, here we are. Our ground of being, as it were, is enormous, mm -hmm. is absolutely enormous, our potential, and we're fishing for minnows. You know, and again, I think it pays to take a look at that. Where am I fishing in the shallows? Where am I settling for less? Uh, where am I not stepping up to the plate? You know, and these are inconvenient questions. I get it. You know, this is, this is stuff that's going to keep you up at night. To ask yourself why you're fishing for minnows when you're standing on a whale. Why you're avoiding your passions and your gifts and your talents and your voice. And those are not necessarily comfortable conversations. Well, and I think um, some people perhaps would answer this question, well, I am not, you know, you know, you may think that you're great, but I don't have the gifts that you have. I don't have the talents that you have. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, you know, what is it that I have to contribute? What is it, you know, in which way should I be self-actualized? So what would you answer to those people? I mean, should all of us ask those questions? Should all of us search for that? Yes, I think so. I don't think we should search for it um, as a competitive sport. <laughs> You know, because what you were describing was the game of comparing yourself to other people and coming out on the fuzzy end of the lollipop. Right. You know, um, I don't think that's useful for people. The point is, how far have you come from where you started, mm -hmm. not from where the other guy is? Right. You know, um, and it's tempting. We live in a very competitive world, and it's easy to do that. And, um, you know, I, I, but I think the question is, what are my gifts? Mm -hmm. Where are my passions? Where can I contribute? Um, and to really focus on that and not think that it's got to make you rich and famous. It's got to be world changing. Um, you know, this again is why I say take small steps toward whatever feels enlivening to you, whatever that behavior happens to be. And look at what happens and how you feel as a result of doing that. Because my experience is it's enormously empowering. You know, to, for instance, give somebody a compliment and watch them blossom right in front of your eyes and realize, wow, people are so hungry for validation, for one thing. And I have so much power to offer that service to people. And I think ultimately we're talking about callings and passions. Ultimately, what they tend to lead to for people is service. 
Right. That's really the point, you know, is in how many ways can I serve? You know, and, and, I, and I say it that way, I phrase it that way because I bo I'm borrowing that from the technique called brainstorming. Because the operative question in brainstorming is, in how many ways can I? All mm -hmm. right? And how many ways can I make a living doing what I love? And how many ways can I be of service to people? And how many ways can I um, work with my own resistance? You know, but the question that really opens it up is, in how many ways can I? Right. Right. And, and, you know, um, I think for people who have lived, um, you know, not, I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about young kids out of school, but for mature adults that have lived, had life experience, had ups and downs, um, that perhaps even have gone through pain and sorrow. Um, one of the th ways in which we can all serve is to use the, um, the experiences that we've had, and then use them to support others, to extend our hand oh, to us. Yes. Using our own path as, you know, I have gone through this, I understand what it feels like. And yeah. so we can find passion, it's not in wallowing in the pain, but in using it as, uh, as it now becomes our strength, yeah. that now um, propels us to help others. So that's one of the ways. That I had somebody say to me once, um, you need to learn how to suffer creatively, not just neurotically. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> that was amusing. But, you know, the point, like you just said, is to use our suffering, mm -hmm. right, to um, make art with it, to make dance with it, to plow it in and use it to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, what you just described is the basis of the entire self-help movement on planet Earth. It's the been there factor. Mm -hmm. You know, you have had a, an encounter with um, or a trauma with a particular issue. Um, and you're going to learn from it, you're going to grow from it, and then you're going to turn around and help other people who are uh, faced with the same challenges. It's the been there factor. Um, and it is immensely powerful. I mean, anybody who's ever been in, a, in any kind of a um, self-help group or 12-step um, group, mm -hmm. you know, there's something like 600 of those, knows how this works, is that if you've been there, you can help. And in fact, people of a certain age, meaning I would say 50 and up, okay, mm -hmm. anybody who even vaguely identifies as an elder, um, I think it was Eric Erickson, the psychologist, and Carl Jung, both said that if you are not at this point and older, if you are not involved in what they called generativity, meaning turning around and helping the generations coming up behind you, you're missing the primary developmental point of getting older. Right, because right. it's one of the life stages that focuses on that support for the new generation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it comes back to service. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about um, your other book. Well, actually, it's your first book, right? The Callings. Um, oh, right. And um, so let's start with the definition. How would you, what's a calling? Oh, uh, calling is the, the urgings, the promptings, the imperatives, the signals, the signs that come from inside of your life that simply tell you um, what it's going to take to make your life literally come true, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if not to honor the developmental uh, imperatives of your own life, in other words, the fact that they change. Mm -hmm. All right. So I personally think that the great vocational question is not what do I want to be when I grow up, as you said, uh, or uh, what major should I declare? You mentioned you worked in the university. Right. Uh, the great vocational question, in my opinion, is oh, who am I? Mm -hmm. And who I am changes over time. So will the callings that come through the being that's being called. Okay, so that's all I mean. Callings are the signs and the signals that come in from inside of you that tell you what it's going to take to stay true to true north. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, many, many years ago when I was still sort of very ambiguous about God's existence and didn't know, you know, what life was about. Um, I would hear people, you know, in a church saying, well, I heard a calling or God called me to me and this is what I'm called to do. And I listened to that and I thought that was weird because I didn't know, you know, did, did they hear a voice? You know, did, 
um, like, what does that mean, you know, hear a calling? And then, of course, um, years passed, and I had my own, and I've had, you know, these callings myself now, and, but specifically in 2014, I kind of just started changing my, um, the direction of my entire life from where I thought it was going to where, you know, um, to, to the new direction. And I realized the calling, at least for me, was really just sort of these intuitive, all of a sudden I would get this knowing or thought or, and it was, and to me, spirit really talks to you in whispers, you know, and, um, leave. It starts off that way anyway. Right. And you um, ignore them, it turns into shouts. Well, yes, yes. Um, but, uh, cryon, which is a sort of an energy that I, um, really admire that's a channeled energy. It says that, you know, spirit speaks to you in whispers. So, and what that means is it can come in a very, quiet, right. sort of quietly taps you on the shoulder. It doesn't necessarily hit you over the head with it. So I was wondering if there, in your experience, um, what's the range? Like what, in what form has that calling um, come to people? Yeah. Um, well, like you said, it's, it's a very broad range. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I love this idea of the whispers. I ran across a poet named Wallace Stevens years ago who said, um, and this really spoke to me in the context of researching for the Callings book. He said, I don't ask for the full ringing of the bell. I don't mm -hmm. ask for a clap of thunder. A scrawny cry will do. Yeah. And that's the whisper that you were referring to, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. And, and the scrawny cries come in a very impressive variety of forms. And um, they come through intuitions, as you said. Mm -hmm. I think an intuition is a small calling. Mm -hmm. uh, they come through passions and gifts and dreams. Mm -hmm. all, the, all the world's religions and psychologies seem to agree that dreams are one of the primary channels through which the gods and the goddesses have spoken to the mortals. Okay. Um, they come through song lyrics. You can't get out of your head for weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is the level at which I always encourage people to look at this stuff. Um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with a novelist named Ann Tyler. She wrote the accidental tourist among mm -hmm. other books, and it was made into a movie with William Hurt. And she's a brilliant observer of couple relationships, partner dynamics. She says, I can always tell what my husband is really thinking by the tunes that he absentmindedly hums in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, callings come through those kind of channels. They come through um, the patterns that have established themselves in your life by this point in time. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, like I said, the lessons you've endlessly had to learn or mistakes you continually make. They come through wherever there's friction in your life. There's a calling trying to come through. It's, it's, it's like in the natural world. Friction happens where changes are trying, trying to take place. Mm -hmm. right? They come through a decision that needs to be made in your life now, not stuck on the back burner for another five years. Um, they come through... Uh, by, obviously body symptoms. I mean, I've got a whole chapter in that book called The Language of the Body, uh -huh. right? Like we were saying, the word symptom etymologically means a, a sign. Right. So a very broad range of channels through which calls come to us. And it just pays to kind of broaden your, your, your scope, your aperture, and really kind of post centuries at these various gates to get the information what, when it's coming through. You know, in other words, having the receiver turned on, one of the things that Campbell t taught us was that um, the great sacrilege, this is his language, the mm -hmm. great sacrilege in terms of the soul's integrity is what he called inadvertence, meaning not paying attention. Absolutely. Being inadvertent, having the receivers turned off rather than on and not being mindful, not paying attention. Right, and, and I think um, I would add um, synchronicities to the, that list of the things that come through. And, and I think as we become more mindful, as we begin to pay more attention, the synchronicity, the, the sort of the rate of synchronicities kind of revs up and, and you start um, getting these signs and signals from very unexpected sources, you know. Um, right. Oh, I couldn't agree. I would definitely add synchronicities to those, yeah. those meaningful coincidences. Right. So what happens when we say no or when we don't pay attention to the calling? Like, is there other consequences? Is yeah. There... Oh, absolutely. There's consequences either way. I figure if you're going to suffer, whether you follow your calls or whether you don't, you might as well suffer in the service of your passions. And, <laughs> right. you know, 
you know, die doing what you love than what you don't. Um, but yes, the consequences are that you put your calls in the position of having to come after you with a pitchfork. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you turn calls into wake up calls. Um, you know, what some people call the two by four approach to consciousness raising. <laughs> um, and again, that's because of what we were talking about earlier is, the, you know, you, you can't ignore calls and, and expect that they're not, they're, they're just going to go away. You know, for better and for worse, the search party is not going to retire. Um, you know, it's just not. It's gonna, they're going to they're gonna try to pop through until the last possible moment of life. You know, whatever the, the awakenings and awarenesses and calls and gifts that you have that you're supposed to be working on, they're going to try their darndest to come through. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there'll be a certain amount of suffering that, that, that's going to hit the fan if you continue to say no. It's one thing to do it in the short term. It's one thing to negotiate with calls like some people do um, and say, um, I'm going to do it in two years when I've taken care of this or when the kids are finally grown or whatever. It's, it's one thing to negotiate with them and you can negotiate with them. I mean, calls are not, you know, these are not like subpoenas. You know, you have a, you have a vote. Um, right. I was, you know, I, was, I wanted to... Uh kind of stress that we do have free will you know it's not it's not that we are tied up and you know it's like it's not negotiable you must do it we do have a choice absolutely and one of those choices is to continue to ignore it for years right. and years and decades and decades and um that is a choice that's a decision um but you're not going to do that without consequences right right that's my that's my experience as well as my observation right um and so is it, how do you know when the calling is a true calling or if it, you know, are there times when we think we're supposed to be doing something and it's yeah. really maybe not? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the discernment tasks, um, well, that's the term the spiritual community is all used for figuring out what your calls are is discernment mm -hmm. is figuring out, um, does it emanate from, you mentioned God or soul or spirit or authenticity, um, or does it emanate from ego and wishful thinking and the desire for security and the desire to please your parents and um, the desire to prove something to the world, you know, um, and is the, and which of va various calls are you supposed to act on is another discernment issue. Because mm -hmm. Many people get a lot of calling simultaneously sometimes, and they have to pick among them. Um, but, and here's this is the thing, I ask everybody, how did you know that this was the choice you were supposed to make? I mean, of all the multitudes of possible life paths, mm -hmm. how did you know this was the right one, at least at this point in time? And the responses that people have shared with me are so incredibly consistent. Um, I, I'm literally going to list these for you because it's that easy. People okay. said that they knew a call was true um, as opposed to false when it kept coming back. Mm -hmm. It came at them through a lot of different direct, from a lot of di different directions and through a lot of different channels, mm -hmm. dreams and synchronicities and the books that mysteriously find their way onto your night table um, and the kind of opportunities that make their themselves known to you. In other words, there's a clustering effect. Mm -hmm. People knew a call was true when it scared them. That was interesting. I mean, one guy said, I, I figure if a call is, feels really safe and easy, it's suspect. But if it scares the daylights out of me, it means I'm close to something vital. Right. Um, they, uh, let's see, true calls. Um, you tend to feel a sense of rightness about them that you can't necessarily explain. Exactly, yeah but you can't deny either. It just feels right. It feels right. right. Uh, and it's a match between who you are and what you do. Uh, or as a theologian named uh, Frederick Buchner once said, it, it's the place where your deep gladness intersects with the world's deep hunger. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That's the sweet spot, he said. Um, let's see. Calls are true um, when you find that you have a great deal of patience and forbearance for all the mundane tasks that are involved in pulling it off and mm -hmm. bringing it to fruition in the world. Um, you know, for instance, um, writing. My, my brother Ross has, has said to me that writing seems and teaching seems glamorous to him. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is 
that writing involves sitting my bum on a chair for hours and hours and hours and hours, day after day, year after year, decade after decade. Right. Every call, um, the true ones have their versions of licking stamps and stuffing envelopes and you know, um, making cold calls and slapping up flyers on telephone poles and whatnot. You know, but you have a certain um, um, affection almost for all the mundane work, do what you love to do. And when you have that kind of attitude about all that mundane stuff, that's, that's, a, that's a diagnostic tool that says you're on the right track. You don't resent, you know. In order to get, um, I travel 100 days out of the year of teaching based on my books. 50% um, of my time is spent working to get work. Mm -hmm. working to get those in the engagements and working to get uh, assignments from editors. I don't resent that 50% because it's part of getting to do what I love to do. That's a true call to me. Right. And finally, uh, everybody said some version of this. True call, the only way to tell is ultimately in the results. Okay, in other words, you've got to be willing to try them out to some degree sooner than later, and again, take field notes. You know, you've got to be willing to go down the path even when you're not sure it's the path mm -hmm. and, um, and look at the feedback that your life gives you. But that's ultimately the way people have said to me, they figure out whether a call's true or false by trying it out. So what would be, like, can you give an example of a, a false call? Because, you know, when we say it's a calling, then maybe it might be difficult to sort of determine Then everything sounds like. Yeah, that. well, uh, you know, um, I met a young guy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison a few years back who came up to me after my presentation and said that he's in medical school and he feels like this is really, he wants to be a doctor. And in the course of the conversation, um, it turned out that what was really going on there was that his father had threatened that if he did not go into pre-med, he would not pay for his education. Right, yeah. Okay, so there is a, there's a falseness in there. He had right. taken it on like this was what he was gonna do and what he was called to do was to be a doctor, but it was actually his father's calling, not his. Right, right, yeah. And yeah, yeah. I've seen a lot of those. Right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, and it's important to discern where you leave off and where other people begin. Or maybe more to the point to remember you know, because um, most of us, I have a friend in California who told me that she had an interaction with her five-year-old daughter who I guess wanted to do something mommy didn't think advisable. And, um, and she says to her daughter, um, Jenea, honey, I, would, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> to which Jenea replied, but mommy, you're not me. And right. she, was five. she was five years old. I mean, you know, my point is that we, we knew where that line was very early on in the game. Mm -hmm. That's why I say maybe part of the task is remembering what we already know. Right. And most of the time when we speak, we say things that have been sort of implanted into yeah. us by society, by the people we trust. Um, by teachers, by mentors, teachers. by parents. Right, exactly. And so just becoming aware of them and starting to discern, you were talking about discernment. Um, is it me really talking? Is it my passion talking? Or is it the, you know, those around me talking through, through me? Exactly, right. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, um, in all honesty, that can be a moment of crisis for some people to oh, realize that yeah. they've been operating perhaps for their whole lives on other people's calls, other people's messages, other people's admonitions, and mm -hmm. um, to realize how much time has slipped away from them as a result of doing that can be a, a moment of crisis. But crisis is also the flip side of the coin of, of, of awakening. Can. Right. So um, now you mentioned that one of the things um, somebody told you that when they hear a calling, they know that it's true because it scares them. Yeah. So, and we talked a little bit about resistance, but I really want to uh, get more into it now. Um, so I saw some that as you were processing your own experience with your calling and you were experiencing your own resistance, yeah. you were using artwork to really, um, uh, I guess, process that, right, creatively. And I saw some of it and, it, and I could really relate to the emotions that surround that process yeah. so can you tell us more about maybe your own experience as you were going through that and how art plays into that 
Yeah. Um, well, what this was, um, you know, for, for our listeners is um, I was chronicling a calling in images. Mm -hmm. um, I do that in, in uh, writing journals all the time, but um, somebody suggested to me that I do it as art, not just as, as words. And so I kept a drawing journal for two years while I was um, going through a call to leave city life for country life. That was the call. Mm -hmm. And so for two years, I kept this drawing journal, trying to capture in images the emotional states I was going through as I was navigating, uh, negotiating this calling. And it was um, a very powerful process to help me understand what was going on. And, you know, the picture that's worth a thousand words kind mm -hmm. of an approach. Uh, right. So it was more right brain than left. It was mm -hmm. more visceral than, in, than mental. Um, and so... Um, using artwork in the service of self-discovery is a great discernment tool. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I make that distinction as opposed to art that you, the point is to slap it up on a wall or exhibit right. it. Right. Um, this, is, this is for the point of self-discovery. So mm -hmm. something like a, a drawing journal is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it really helped me to look at everything that was coming up for me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and quite a bit of the bad and the ugly when I, when I look back on it because I had so much resistance to moving. I mean, I'm from New York, mm -hmm. you know? And when it was my ex-wife who came to me one day out of the blue and said, I want to move to the country. That was the beginning of the calling. And, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I said, what country? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Every, we were living in San Francisco at the time and everything is, I said, honey, everything's here. Right. Our park is here. Our friends are here. Our our rent controlled house is here. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so I just that was just the beginning of the resistance that I had. But it's really important to process the resistance because if you don't really face it, again, tea with the demons, um, it's just going to keep haunting you, and you're not going to really move forward. You're going to continually hit walls. Um, and it was by doing this artwork that I was able to really move through and understand the resistances and what they what they meant so dream work is another way of dealing with um images because who was it um oh can't remember the psychologist's name he wrote a book called uh, the soul's code james hillman said when you want to know what your soul really wants turn to your images mm -hmm. Meaning art and dreams or dreams mm -hmm. because those are both imagistic languages um, not that words won't do the trick, uh, you know, they do too, but images are much more primal, much more original, uh, much more visceral. And mm -hmm. so I, I think finding ways to deal constructively, to suffer creatively with your, whatever resistance has come up. Um, and they come, and they come in a lot of forms also, you know, the, the ways that people avoid their powers, their passions, their, um, their gifts. I mean, it comes through, um, things like studying your calling to death for years. Yeah. You know, uh, cause there's always one more angle to consider. There's always one more expert to consult or skill to build or, uh, right. you know, I saw a New Yorker cartoon years ago. There's a man standing at a crossroads and there's two signs in front of him. One says to heaven. The other says workshops on how to get to heaven. <laughs> You know, and so studying your call to death, you're hiding behind the tasks of discernment is right. what you're doing. Uh, another way is um, waiting for the perfect moment to act. Mm -hmm. It's always way out there somewhere. Right. Um, you know, um, or let's see, um, self-sabotage. Everybody's got their own special brand of self-sabotage. Um, that's a way of avoiding calls. Um, choosing a path in life that's parallel to the one you actually feel called toward, you know? So um, becoming an art critic rather than an artist, mm -hmm. um, or a school teacher rather than a parent, or an editor rather than a writer, um, a talent agent rather than a performer, you know? So I just say lots of forms. Mm -hmm. So I gotta ask you though, um, sort of to be a little bit of a devil's advocate. So in this particular calling, it came from your ex-wife. So how did you know that it was your calling and not just hers? Hers, exactly. Exactly. That, that was one of the questions that I had right in the beginning. It's like, wait, this doesn't have anything to do with me. You want to move to the country. 
But what, as I began to explore my resistances, I realized that the call was mine because for me, the call was relationship. Okay. All right. And I were not married at that point. We've been together several years. She wanted to move to the country and I didn't want to lose her. Mm -hmm. So the call for me was about dropping into relationship at a level I had not ever reached at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. So the call wasn't for me to move to the country. It was to dive into relationship at a deeper level. So that call became mine quickly. Though the fact is, in retrospect, what happened when we moved, where we moved from San Francisco to north of Taos, New Mexico, by eight miles, a little town called Arroyo Seco, Mm -hmm. uh, what happened to me when I was out there um, was the beginning of the Callings book, which I don't think would have been written if I hadn't gotten quiet enough to hear that call to write that book. Mm -hmm. and I needed to be away from a city, I think, to do that with all the distractions of a city. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it was a call I didn't even recognize till it was actually happening. That, wow, if, if I hadn't moved out here, I wouldn't have heard all these messages talking about following calls. And needless to say, my wife was thrilled to remind me of that. <laughs> in, in, in retrospect, that if, if we hadn't moved out there just because of the two years worth of resistance on my part. Right. Um, if that, if I, we hadn't done that, that book would not have been written. And that was game changing for me. So it's interesting that, so you started with one calling, but basically you, as you started unpacking it, yeah. It came to something else. You've discovered something else. I, I discovered that it was mine. It was yours, but, but not quite about the place. Right. It didn't about seem like it was about place, it, but right. it was about relationship. Right. And the dynamic was the same. It would be moving mm -hmm. to a new place. But for me, it was more about following the call to be in relationship. Um, but again, I had to be willing to unpack it, as you said and really look at what, what was the resistance that I had to that. You know, because if it was just about moving from one place to another, why was my resistance so ferocious? Right. Yeah, I mean, you saw some of those pictures. Mm -hmm. you know, my, my wife, my ex-wife said to me at one point, she goes, because I started sharing them in my workshop, she goes, you're not, you're not showing those to people before bedtime, are you? Yeah. Right? <laughs> because some of the images were full of anger and rage and, right. and frustration. Um, and yeah. yeah, and so I was like, why am I so, so volatile around this? And I think it was not because of moving to the country. Mm -hmm. It was because what that, what that represented to me, her request for that was it was committing to relationship and that mm -hmm. scared me. Right. And so, uh, can you share maybe a little bit about and how, how did you process it, you know, once you've become aware of it, let's say. So what can people do as they unpack certain things and they realize, well, oh, this is what is holding me back, or this is what I'm afraid of, or this is where the resistance is. What do they do with that? Then? Yeah. Do do? Well, I'm a big believer in dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, including self-reflective dialogue is, um, and sometimes, again, this comes under the heading suffering creatively. Let's say you identify a resistance, a voice of resistance. Let's say it comes down to faith versus fear mm -hmm. or passion versus security or um, me versus mom, whatever. So you have, you've identified um, two contending characters. Mm -hmm. One thing, might do and one thing I've done many times is um, write out a conversation between the two of them on paper so literally you know they're like you're writing a screenplay between a dialogue mm -hmm. between two characters um, and you write them going down the page faith fear faith fear faith fear you go back and forth mm -hmm. and back and forth and let the two of them have a conversation or an argument or whatever for a half an hour without taking your fingers off the keyboard all right and let them have it out let them unpack what's going on between them because the, what comes out is sometimes stunning revelation when you realize what the two are really after and that the two are actually closer than they think they are or that the voice of no is actually a protector voice. Absolutely. Um, and so lots of revelations by letting the two uh, antagonists come together and have a conversation with one another and educate one another. Right. And exactly. And I, uh, you know, we do that in hypnosis where, which is what you're talking about is really going to a subconscious um, 
purpose of the um, the things that are our resistances, but they usually have a purpose, and they usually have a positive purpose as far as it's concerned. Right. Um, and so in hypnosis, we allow people to have that conversation. We bring them into the room, and we give the voice to that resistance, and they yes. they don't write it, but they have a conversation. And they find um, exactly what you said, very, um, very revealing um, information about why that resistance was in place. And usually it's because it's protecting the person in some way, things that are serving the purpose. Another version of this is dream work. Mm -hmm. Um, Most dream books say that when you're being chased in a dream, and we've all had chase dreams where we're being pursued, um, the point is um, at some point, and if you can do this in lucid dreaming, all the better you can actually do it in the dream but after the dream you turn around and you ask the pursuer to give you the message that they're chasing you to deliver uh-huh. which is a whole reframe of being right chased. right you know, and they're not necessarily out to do you harm they're they're there to give you a message right yeah wonderful yeah. so um as we near the conclusion of our conversation i want to ask you one final question um as we are activating our consciousness and um we're heading towards greater potential you know we're heading towards greater self-actualization what are you excited about in terms of our potential in terms of you know the things that you're writing about that are passion and uh, now do you mean our as in collective our or our as in our individual um, collective, individual, just what are you, um, you know, I'm, one of the goals of these conversations is like, for me, is to help people get excited about what's possible for us. Mm-hmm. If we, um, you know, as we understand ourselves better and we um, really follow our true selves and follow our passions, what's possible for us as human beings? Yeah. Well, that's the question that animates me. Mm-hmm. Right there is what's possible. We, I think that, um, and I include myself in this, um, life is so rich. Mm-hmm. It's so rich and full of possibilities and full of joy for that matter, despite the world in its present shocking condition. Right. Um, and we settle for so little. And um, we were fishing for minnows mm-hmm. um, and standing on a whale. And so I want to know what the whale is about. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, obviously one of the images that comes to us when we think of whales is the story of Jonah. Mm-hmm. You know, and the whale was the vehicle that took him to his destiny. When he finally admitted that he was running from a call, um, he was delivered a whale who took him to where he was supposed to be and took him to the largeness of his life. Um, and what is the whale about for each one of us? What are the vehicles of our own Um, deliverance to our own fate and our own destiny and our own power and our contribution. So um, I just think that we, every one of us, no matter how small we're thinking, we have ways that we can contribute and we can serve and we can um, find enjoyment in life. And I just think that we're standing in front of a, a, a feast table and we're starving ourselves. Yeah. And so I just, I'm just really committed and excited by the, the prospect of um, doing the self-actualization work and reaching my potential, our potential, mm-hmm. um, and, um, and thriving rather than just surviving. Right. Absolutely. Um, so, Greg, as um, for our listeners right now, where can they find your books? And um, if you'd like to share what else you're up to, maybe they will be around where you're presenting and can sure. um, attend. Yeah, well, the, the simplest way to do that is just to go to my website. It's all on the website, my speaking schedule, um, mm-hmm. the books, um, all kinds of fun stuff. But it's greglevoy.com, G-R-E-G-G-L-E-V-O-Y.com. Uh-huh. Great. Wonderful. Greg, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. It was really a pleasure. And please continue following your callings and keep writing and keep helping people self-actualize. Thank you. And same to you. I appreciate your good work in the world. Thank you very much. All right. right. Bye. Bye.